and we'll see now we're broadcasting and we're waiting for people to join in the audience right. um so people I'm at the are beach. that's good <laughs> i am i'm really at the beach i'm looking at the ocean i'm such positive right now <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to get us started um, as people are joining um, and coming in to the webinar. Uh, I wanna introduce myself. I'm Sarah Higgins. I'm the editor and artistic director of Art Papers. And I wanna welcome everyone to Sounding Stories, Oral Histories of Grassroots Atlanta, presented by Art Papers in partnership with Meredith Cooey, who is here and will join in later. Sounding Stories is made possible in large part by Emory University's Stuart A. Rose Manuscript, Archives, and Rare Book Library, and is supported by Georgia Humanities in partnership with the Georgia Department of Economic Development through funding from the Georgia General Assembly. This discussion is the second one in a five-part, two-day symposium, which takes a decade-by-decade -decade look at some of Atlanta's DIY, artist-run, and grassroots art spaces. This series is focused on beginnings, the events and broader context that led to the creation of these spaces, the opportunities that allowed them to come into being, and the challenges that had to be overcome. Right now, we're joined by the founders, co-founders, or folks involved with the genesis of projects that began in the 2000s, or the OOs, as I like to call them. Um, <laughs> there will be time for questions from our audience in the last 30 minutes of the panel. You can submit questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, um, and you can submit those at any time during, uh, during the talk. We will get to them when we get to Q&A. Um, if you see a question you like, you can give it a little thumbs up rather than repeating it, and that'll bump it up to the top. Um, we will use the chat function to provide information and links for the audience, so be sure to keep an eye on that window um, for folks in the audience. We'll, we'll do some talking to you in that way. Each panel in this series is moderated by a member of the community who experienced these initiatives firsthand, uh, and in several cases who operated or participated in similar concurrent projects. For this panel, we're very pleased to welcome moderator Felicia Feaster, who is um, joining us by, via headshot and voice. Um, and Felicia is the editor uh, of HGTV Travel Channel and an AJC, AJC art critic. She's managing uh, editor, editor also at TravelChannel.com and an award-winning art, lifestyle, and film writer whose work has appeared in The Economist, Elle, New York Press, Playboy, uh, Travel and Leisure, Art in America, Art Papers, Close to Our Hearts, and The Atlanta Journal-Constitution, where she's served as the art critic for the past nine years. She's the co-author of Forbidden Fruit, the Golden Age of the Exploitation Film, and co-founder of the Atlanta Film Critics Circle. Felicia, thank you so much. And as you introduce our panelists, and I hand it over to you, I'm going to be showing some slides, some images of the spaces represented by the folks here on this panel today. Thank so. you, Sarah, and thank you uh, to Art Papers for inviting me to participate in this. Uh, for me, the 2000s were a really interesting, productive time in Atlanta's art history, and all of the panelists here today helped to make it so. So I'm really delighted to participate in this. And I'll go ahead and introduce each of the panelists. Um, Karen Fain is the proprietor and visual art curator at Apache Cafe. In 2000, Karen, along with her husband and business partner, opened Apache Cafe to cultivate and nurture music and art. Her husband, Asa, focused on music while Karen handled art. In doing so, Karen curated an art event known as Art Mondays that would host early exhibitions of now established artists such as Fahamu Piku, Kevin Sipp, John Tyndall, Michi Meko, Jamel Wright, Josa Kim and Charlie Palmer, among others. We also have with us Brian Holcomb. Brian Holcomb is an artist, curator, and educator. From 2002 to 2014, he was the founder and director of Saltworks, a contemporary art gallery in Atlanta. His artwork has been reviewed by Creative Loafing, Atlanta, Connect Savannah, and the Atlanta Journal Constitution and included in the permanent collection of the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. 
And then we have Anne-Marie Manker. She's an artist represented by White Space Gallery and a former SCAD professor. Anne-Marie Manker lived and worked in Atlanta, Georgia as an artist and professor from 1994 to 2019. She founded and directed the Alternative Space Art Spot Gallery from 2001 to 2004, which was awarded Best Alternative Art Space in 2003 in Atlanta by Creative Loafing Magazine or newspaper. In 2005, she formed Golden Blizzard Art Collective with artist Alex Caveras. We also have with us James McConnell, the co-owner of Beep Beep Gallery. James McConnell has collaborated with Mark Basehor on projects including Metrotonic Zine, Beep Beep Gallery, Artlantis Arts and Music Festival, and Mother Bar and Restaurant. And finally, we also have with us Joey Orr. Joey Orr is an editor, writer, and currently the Andrew W. Mellon Curator for Research at the Spencer Museum of Art at the University of Kansas, where he directs the Integrated Arts Research Initiative and serves as affiliate faculty in the Institute for Policy and Social Research, Museum Studies, and Visual Art. He previously worked at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, founded the Idea Collective John Q, and served on the editorial advisory board for art papers, among others, and he is here today to represent uh, Shed Space, the um, art space that he founded. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the questions, and I welcome all of the panelists to just chime in when they have a thought. Um, the first thing I wanted to know in starting your art space, what were the needs you identified that you were trying to address? What were your goals in starting your space? Anne-Marie, you want to go first? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, I'll go first. Um, I guess the, the overall goal was to provide a space to up and coming and emerging artists who weren't necessarily represented by a gallery um, and perhaps even they were still a student in grad school studying that they could have a space to show their work. And, um, uh, you know, I, I would put out open calls to the community to see who responded and it was very organic. It started with a solo show, Andrew Level, and it grew from there. And as well, um, I was inviting curators to come and present their projects to make shows in the space. Um, there were solo exhibitions, group exhibitions, and over the years it, it, it grew beyond just fine arts into um, for example, we had info demo series where there were authors, writers, performers, musicians in the space, um, aside from the fine art exhibitions that we hosted. So it was a mix of sorts, but overall it was to just bring in um, up and coming artists and to support them. Um, Karen, I'll repeat the question and if you wanna um, give your response, what were the needs you identified that you were trying to address? What were your goals in starting Apache Cafe? And you may need to unmute. But I think we went into it. I think we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Um, does someone else want to maybe jump in momentarily and answer the question while Karen figures out the um, connection? I can start, Felicia. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I'll just give more of a context. When I started uh, Saltworks, I just moved back the previous year from Chicago where I finished uh, undergraduate at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, which Joey knows as well. And, and when I came back here, I was working at the High Museum. So I wasn't really familiar with the Atlanta art scene, even though I'm from Atlanta. This is where I grew up. 
and living in Chicago. Um, I was there from 97 to 2001. Kind of really was my introduction to what contemporary art and contemporary artists working, uh, but also contemporary art venues. And a lot of the people who I saw were my fellow classmates who were doing their own artist-run spaces in the warehouse districts uh, of the West Loop area in Chicago, which completely different today for anybody. But back then it was just a bunch of warehouses and you still had one or two galleries, but that was also where all the prop companies were, which is where I learned about setting up exhibitions. And then I worked for a lot of uh, the art fairs there during which, because that was a great gig at, for a student. So when I came here to Atlanta, this was like my knowledge because growing up here, I didn't necessarily visit many of the galleries at all. I only knew of a couple and that was in the West Paces Ferry. So I was coming from more of this broad open installation industrial. So working at the High Museum, installing the shows, that was my introduction to the Atlanta art scene because my coworkers were um, artists. And so they introduced me to that. And I just happened to become across a warehouse space, which used to be a piano factory that where they rebuilt Steinway. So it was a Butler style building. It was 12,000 square feet. And it had become available because the owner had passed away and the family didn't know what to do with the space. And I was documenting it as one of my side jobs, which as an artist, you usually have two or three. Um, for, for an estate. And when I saw the space, I, everything just kind of clicked in knowing it's like, wait a minute, I could replicate some of the things that I witnessed in Chicago that I witnessed some of my classmates doing. So, and I was looking for a studio space. So that was my original goal. And the, the gallery became a new goal because I saw that, oh, I could put together shows and that would bring people to the, uh, the warehouse, but also I needed to rent out studios, which was what was going to support the gallery and the exhibitions that I wanted to do because I had never done this before. I didn't even know there was a really a need um, for, for the type of shows that I was doing until I actually opened up and then all these people showed up. So that was a nice thing. I mean, but the, I was just trying to be comfortable with what I knew. And as Anne-Marie said, it was organic. I mean, it just kind of evolved. And also Joey could probably add on to this with his space and everything because Joey was the one who wrote my press release for the first show and also supplied his mailing list, but we won't talk about that. Um, which was a wonderful, like, uh, that was a wonderful gift. And that's a lot of what you'll see about with a lot of these spaces and the, some of the goals is like community. Well, I had a space and then the community kind of found me and I tried to replicate that or expand on that because I wanted to see local artists. I also wanted to see international artists that I had witnessed in Chicago and at the fairs. And I wanted to find a meeting point for those things. So. Uh, Karen, are you back with us? You want um, to try to address the question? <laughs> <laughs> so we're just basically Absolutely. talking about, you know, the needs that you identified that you wanted to address mm -hmm. in opening Apache Cafe. Um, I wanted it to be a space when we opened it to display art of local artists first and foremost, and it evolved into a community that um, nurtured and hosted artists that are today doing great things. It was just a need that people saw to want to share their work. And when we opened the space, we were so willing to do that, that we, um, we, we met a need unknowingly, which was to kind of cultivate an art scene that kind of operated on a give and take. Um, they gave such um, beautiful works to the space and we put it first and foremost and displayed it to share it and it just grew into a larger existence of every Monday showing art doing uh, figure drawing sessions and welcoming the art community not just in this place to look at art but to create in the space to make it kind of cool and um, 
the thing to do on a Monday night if you had an inkling of wanting to grow as an artist, hang around artists, display your work. Yeah. It was many things. You're breaking up a tad. I think we're going to maybe move on. We achieve to surround ourselves with creative people. Awesome. Thank you, Karen. Are you um, still there, Felicia? Yeah, yeah. Um, James, do you want to address this question and talk about, you know, why you decided to start Beep Beep, what, you know, needs you identified um, that you wanted to serve? Uh, sure. Um, when I graduated college, I moved back to Atlanta and lived in Oakhurst with three guys. And I think we had just thrown away like all the cool posters or whatever you do when you're an undergrad. And so we had this house that was like uh, just full of white walls. And uh, we had heard from Youngblood that that's how they got started with their gallery, was doing art shows. So we just asked the people we knew if they wanted to put up art. And so we did a few shows there. And then, um, and then a friend of ours, Joy, had a space called L'Avenue that was um, in Midtown. And he wanted to leave right as we were about to leave this house. So he offered us that space, which was super awesome um and was like six hundred dollars a month uh something that like i worked at a coffee shop so like the three of us could afford to pay rent without really knowing if it would work or not like i had i was 22 i had no clue how to do any of it or whether it would work it was it just seemed like a low risk scenario and kind of what brian is saying like just by virtue of having a space and utilizing it then all of a sudden people were like oh cool i like have art I'm like really into this stuff and the community came to us uh, people presented ideas and then all of a sudden we had you know not just people we knew but people they knew and then we had undergraduates and then graduate students and then professors like Emory like we started to get more recognition and then people were more comfortable showing in our space so I would say that like intentionally there was no reason for doing any of it it was just like a bunch of kids fucking around but like <laughs> yeah, it evolved into something that we took seriously and eventually became something that was like a big part of our lives. And how about you, Joey? I mean, Shed Space was, these are all really unique spaces, but yours was, you know, especially interesting in the way the art was presented. You know, what were the needs you identified that you felt, you know, caused you to open Shed Space or start Shed Space? Um, it's so fun doing this. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I just, it's, it's fun to think about how I would have answered this question if you'd asked me 20 years ago versus how I'd answer it now. <laughs> um, and I would say that my original goals changed pretty quickly after just a couple of years. So the reason that I actually started Shed Space was um, I visited um, the Blue Star Arts Complex, um, which is in San Antonio. And there was an artist there, Ethel Shipton, who was doing a project room, which was just like a, a small center block space in the back of the art center. And um, during the openings where like all the movers and shakers of their art community showed up, she would offer the space to emerging artists and they would have one week, they would have three days to set up anything they wanted to do. And then on the opening night, she'd put a keg in the parking lot and get everybody to come in and meet the artist and understand the artist's work. And then they would have the following three days to return the space to its original condition. And I thought it was a great concept. And I was, um, like in 99, I was at a party in East Atlanta and a friend of mine had just bought a house and he was like, what am I gonna do with this shed? And I'm like, oh my God, we could totally do this in sheds all around the city. But, but as the project moved forward and I was actually had the weird job of finding sheds and transitioning neighborhoods and asking people if we could use it as an exhibition space. Um, one of the things I started doing was attending neighborhood association meetings to let people know about shed space and see if anyone was interested. And real early on, there was a neighborhood association meeting in, I think it was the one in Oakhurst. And I understood that the, that the community um, hosted annual fundraisers because there were families in the neighborhood who could no longer afford to pay their property taxes because the um, 
values were going up so high because the neighborhoods were transitioning. And it was then, I don't know if I would have used this language back then, but it was then where I had to shed a little bit of my privilege um, and understand the complicity of um, artists and people like me moving into these neighborhoods that are um, economically and racially divided. And so like, if I look back over my roster, you know, from 2000 to 2004, like right in the middle, all of a sudden I'm, I'm learning from my mentors in the art community about diversity and about what sorts of things I needed to be paying attention to. So my goals midway through and for the rest of the time really was about situating art production in the context of transitioning and gentrifying neighborhoods, but I didn't know that going in. Um. So I guess I'm really interested from also hearing from all of you about what was the kind of political and cultural landscape in Atlanta like at the time that made you also want to start an art space? You know, what was the art scene that that um, that existed that inspired you? Um, maybe you saw a gap or a void or maybe you're just responding to, you know, what was going on in Georgia? Um. Can I go? Sure. Okay. Um, and just to give a, a, a brief little back history on the space that I had, um, it was in a warehouse type space pre Beltline. Um, the space exists or existed on the Beltline um, at a time when the neighborhood was transition in an early state of transition. Um, it used to be uh, recording studios back there in that warehouse and artist spaces. And um, at the time, it felt like, the, for me at least, that there was this freedom that one could do anything, that there were a lot of possibilities, um, perhaps because the rent was still cheap, um, perhaps because it was a neighborhood um, that wasn't popular. Um, so fortunately, I was in a position where I had this space that I didn't have to pay rent because it was connected to a post-production facility. And they were using it for two offices that they barely used. And so we had this space um, that was, you know, I didn't have to pay rent because it was a part of this business. It was supported um, by Tube. Um, but during this time, um, you know, we moved into Tube around 1999. And around this time, perhaps even 2000, um, I don't know if you guys remember, there was Visual Arts Network of Atlanta, Vanna. Uh, I think it was spearheaded by Kathy Bird, who was the director at Georgia State uh, Gallery. And I remember going to these meetings where um, we were trying to merge commercial galleries with nonprofits with alternative spaces. And how could we you know, form a, a greater collaborative community but during these meetings also, um, the topic of diversity was coming up. How can we be more diverse? Because um, of the context of that time, it, um, to me, the art scene was fresh and new and, and growing and there wasn't too much happening, but there was a lot of potential to bring more people together to create diversity. So I do remember you know, going to those meetings, talking about that. And I do look back at, at my roster as well and see um, had we continued on past year 2003 or four, um, I think we would have grown in a different direction than how we started. How we started or how I started was kind of by the seat of my pants. I thought, ooh, if iDrum's doing this, I can do this. If Youngblood's doing this, I can do this. All I need is a space. Okay, I'm a very organized person. Um, I'm gonna put a call out for artists and see who bites. So, um, you know, I, I didn't quite have the time to go seek out and, and do a lot of research and pinpoint and find artists. It was coming to me and I would look at the portfolios and if I thought the work was professional, um, I would say, okay, you can have a show and I might not have even met this person. Um, and normally they, it was a lot of local artists and I did tap into Georgia State University because I was going to school there. So I had some contacts there, but I was getting people outside of Atlanta um, applying for shows as well. And we had one international show, an artist from Brazil that um, I sponsored to come because um, 
I was able to get him an honorarium to speak at Georgia State when he was coming for the show in the opening. So um, that's kind of the angle we came from. I don't know if I answered that question <laughs> well or not. <laughs> yeah, does anyone want to talk about that? Yeah, this is Karen, and hopefully if I'm not breaking in and out, I can articulate and respond. Um, just listening to some of the stories shared by others, there's a parallel approach, I think, that we all kind of walked to get to where we were that, you know, allowed us to be considered influential art spaces. We were open to emerging artists. We figured it out as we proceeded. But as I think back to the start for, you know, Art Mondays and uh, Apache, you know, the initial goal was to show some work on the walls and invite artists and their following out and hopefully patronize the business because Apache Cafe was a restaurant, a live entertainment venue, and yes, an art space. So as people came out and looked at the work and we threw an artist talk concept in there and started doing that, people would leave after the artist talk. So as a business owner, I'm thinking, well, I need these people here longer to be involved so from there, I started putting crayons and paper and pencils and paint on the tables and hope that people would create while they were there. And then I had this one artist, Lynn Butler. And um, if you guys could show that image again with Kebby Williams playing the saxophone with the figure drawing pieces in the background, that would be awesome. But Lynn Butler was um, an uh, older artist here in Atlanta, doing amazing um, figurative works and abstract works and she was at Atlanta College of Art. I had solicited that group of artists to come out and use our space to display the work, but on one of her shows, and that's her work in the background, um, she said to me, Karen, this place is great, and that pool table in the back is amazing. It would be even better if you threw a model up there, and I'm like, what the fuck? That is amazing, and from that short comment, we started throwing fabric on top of the pool table and hiring figure models to, to pose for three plus hours every Monday night. And at that moment, the night blossomed. Artists came out with their sketch pads, photographers with their cameras. People were creating in a space that was dedicated to showing the works of creative people. So no, not only were you looking, it became an interactive night. And then people that weren't artists were coming to see people create that were artists. And then this scene just started to evolve. And then meeting more artists gave me an opportunity to do better programming. Um, you know, Michi, Maxwell, Sebastian, John Tyndall, Dosa Kim, Fahamu Piku are all people that allowed me to display their work and do great shows. And that image on the Karen, I think we've lost you again. I'm going to um, ask someone else to answer that question. What was going on in Georgia or Atlanta in terms of the political scene, the cultural scene that maybe you were playing into in creating your space? The two Um, tapping from head to toe, uh, a local artist. Karen, we're having a really hard time hearing you. So I think we're going to have somebody else respond to the question and um, we'll come back to you for the next round. Uh, I'll go, unless you want to go, Brian. No, you can go, James. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, and Karen, I'm sorry, it feels like like right when you're about to like wind down that then your sound starts glitching out. So I'm sorry, we didn't get to hear the end of that. Um, we're, you know, the gallery scene always has like tiers of stuff. There's like super DIY and then there's like middle contemporary and then there's like the high end stuff. And we were definitely in the very low DIY when we started and a lot of the contemporaries we're like in the same place, maybe like a little more seasoned or with a little more money, but all of us were kind of showing sort of similar artists, um, which is like um, in the like pop skateboard tattoo graffiti, like low culture 
that was really popular in the juxtaposed era of like 2004 to 2010. Um, and the reason that I even think about it is that um, we kind of found our own niche or whatever, but um, at the time, everybody was a for-profit gallery. Like there were nonprofits, obviously, uh, like iDrum or something, but like the, the little spaces were for-profit or just like no profit. And um, as the recession hit, all those galleries closed. Like every gallery that we considered like a contemporary other than maybe Youngblood closed. Um, and then you started to see all these new spaces that were nonprofits. Uh, the little galleries that we would have considered ourselves a part of were all then nonprofit spaces. So there was like a huge shift that happened almost immediately after we got involved, which was like a move away from for profit galleries, at least at the small level. Uh, where like you just couldn't sell art like that and you need to be more of a um, grant-based funding group. I just think it's interesting because like a lot of the cool spaces I hear about now are all nonprofit spaces and they come from a super DIY starting point and then get like a hundred grand in like a, a crowdfunding source. Like something absurd that I would have never thought was possible when I was their age and trying to figure out how to just financially keep something going that I thought was cool. Like I would have never just thought like, put something online and then people just give you a shitload of money. But it, it did happen for a few spaces and that's awesome because they got to do a lot of rad stuff and maybe not worry quite as much. I think you were gonna jump in Brian and, and make some observation about like the, the cultural or political landscape at the time. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna repeat what I said before, but I kind of addressed that with the Chicago and seeing the Chicago scene, the warehouse scene, and how I happened to fold that into Atlanta with what I thought Atlanta needed at the time was a more of a balance between the local and international artists, which was how I approached diversity. But I was doing this, I was learning as I go. So, you know, to make things simpler and, and to, I, I went for the for-profit model, even though I operated like a nonprofit. Um, it took people a while to realize that I was actually trying to sell the work, but that's where I, you know, that was probably as much as my fault as anybody else, but that was where I knew starting the uh, space that I had to, you know, having 12,000 square feet. And in the first year I was showing in like from, 2,000 to 8,000 square feet of different shows. And then we had the project room, which Joey um, handled for the first six months. But also I realized it's like I had to have reoccurring income, which is why I had a whole studio program that I modeled after the Atlanta Contemporary Art Center. I actually used their lease for their artist studios to rent out to um, the studios that I had. And that gave me, um, enough of a cushion to learn as I go because I wanted to show more conceptually minded work that might be more challenging formally. And this was just my background as an artist, the work that I kind of gravitated to, but to talk about like with diversity is I was going from diversity and cultural diversity on a you know, international like scale. I mean, I was very fortunate when I opened up to have a good group of artists around me working at the high that was a completely formally based show on color. And that was one of the slide images to where when 10 months down the road where I really felt like I had matured. Um, of course, I was very fortunate that Kojo Griffin was my second show who I met at the opening of the first show. That's how far I planned ahead. Um, just because I was just doing things and always felt like I was catching up. And then 14 years later, I was able to catch up. <laughs> Stop it. Um, when, so after 10 months, when I did uh, the uh, Chenille Kim's like video installation, and then Robin Burnett had an installation in the back. And then I've completely forgetting there was a project room as well. Um, and I can't remember who was paired with it off the top, but all those three things were going together. And I felt like that was such a nice spectrum and, and a very video, at the time I felt like video art wasn't being shown as much. And I 
even though that wasn't written down anywhere, that was something that I always continued to rely on. One, because it was cost effective, like for showing, and I had the technical skills to do it, like well to where it could be an emerging artist, but it looked like it was in a blue chip gallery. Like I wanted those lines to be blurred. So that is something that I was trying to really address. But to really speak to like the climate of what was going on right then and there. So I had a full-time job at the High Museum. It was the best job I ever had. And also the only one that I was hired for in my all years of interviewing, because I was in my late twenties at the time, um, besides independent jobs. And, you know, in the middle of the renovation, is like working at the high, going there in between my lunch breaks, is like September 11th happened, like 9-11 happened. And we were all left out, you know, we were all like the museum closed that day because, you know, the federal building down was on threat alert as well. And so I just did the one thing that I knew how to do. I just drove to the gallery that was still in progress, looking up at the sky with no planes. I mean, this is Atlanta no planes in the sky. It was so quiet. And I was just like, who wants to look at art now? <laughs> I mean, that was like, you know, what was that? Three months before I opened. So fortunately, it's like when we opened and it was just a packed house and everything, all those worries and that anxiety was put at rest because people needed this type of community and gathering place to come together as to you know, to reset almost to ground oneself. So that was another thing about with the gallery and the motivation and doing all this work, but also interacting with all the artists. Like that was my motivation was this was a way that I could kind of ground myself and just to make sense of the world, which is, as we know, especially now is quite chaotic. So That's so interesting to think about September 11th then and the pandemic now and, and how the art world responds. Joey, do you have, I mean, you mentioned gentrification. Were there mm -hmm. other things maybe going on in Atlanta, in Georgia, politically, socially, culturally, that you felt like shed space, you know, had a voice in? Um, yeah, I mean, I think politically, as I mentioned before, the idea of um, how neighborhoods have worked just even historically in Atlanta and how that played with um, the venues that I was occupying. But um, also just in terms of culturally, like I know at least Art Spot and Saltworks and Shed Space really cross pollinated. Like I remember Anne Marie when you first opened Art Spot inviting me, and I think. Um, Kelly and Maggie from Youngblood, and I can't remember who else, and you were like, we're all super young spaces, we need to be thinking about how to support one another, and I even curated actually a couple of shows at your space, and, and I think your graduate thesis show, if I'm not mistaken, was at, in, the, in one of the middle works. spaces of Saltworks, yeah. Yeah, and I exhibited at, at Beep Beep Gallery as well, <laughs> and Brian exhibited his tuning forks at Art Spot. That's Which right. Point, a show that you <laughs> annually curated. Yeah. You know, um, we closed the space down. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're going to go no. out. <laughs> no, it was a rock star death. <laughs> um, but one thing I, I would add is that I remember like all of this energy at that time. And um, um, I'm not sure when Beep Beep actually opened, but Karen, I know your space was over on third. And there was so much energy sort of like Atlanta's going to do it this time. It's going to be awesome. And I remember going to this panel at the Contemporary and Larry Jens Anderson was talking, was there because of his um, activity with Taboo. And everyone was saying that kind of stuff. Atlanta's really going to do it. And Larry's like, this is what everyone always says. And, um, you know, since I've, I've, I, I've had a little distance from Atlanta, um, at this point in my career, it's like when I go back to Atlanta, one of the things I think is so amazing is that DIY spaces can happen. I mean, that's not really actually possible in all art ecologies in every city. And, mm -hmm. you know, so going back to Atlanta now, I'm like, 
you know, why do all the second cities want to be a first city? There's so many things you can do as a second city that you can't do as a first city, like relax and enjoy that, you know? And I think really just even the, the fact that, that Art Papers is supporting panels on DIY spaces that start in the 70s, you know, is like really case in point. So that's one thing I, I just sort of would like to point out in terms of the cultural milieu. That's a great um, point, Joey, and something I wanted to ask everyone about. Like, how would you compare the indie gallery landscape in your time to how it is now? Is it fundamentally different today or just another version of what you were doing? I would like to speak on that. I think the comparison is this because I've been trying to get out and keep my finger on the pulse of what's happening now. And I think it's just different, but a continuation and, and told a different way. Um, the whole concept of a lot of DIY spaces, I think exists because we don't have a lot of galleries that are um, selling work of local artists and giving them places to show. The DIY places, I think, are more open arms, welcoming, fueled by their creativity and make that um, possibility exist organically, seamlessly, it's possible. So I think we thrive and we keep, you know, um, evolving and challenging ourselves, engaging other spaces and seeing what they're doing and learning from them, interpreting what they're doing differently. So I think what we did was create an environment where that was the norm, possible and natural. And we struggled, I think, a little more because um, marketing was different. It costs more to produce and promote a show when we were doing things. So we used people, wonderful people like uh, Felicia Feaster and Nurtured Relationships where she would come out and critique and write about what we were doing in the paper. That was considered an established show if she wrote about you. So to have that happen for Art Mondays and Apache on a regular help to fuel what we're doing. Today's artists can do it via Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, free of charge, get the word out and draw shows and people are coming. So that's what they're doing now. So they're doing it differently. They're marketing, marketing um, effortlessly with smooth visuals and using a new medium to do it. It's rich and it's different. This uh, artist I've been following, um, Eric Nines, phenomenal, phenomenal, um, is doing some great things here locally and he's traveling regionally and does graffiti and he merges that with fine art, but yet he's multimedia filmmaking and using the internet to help promote what he's doing. So it's DIY using newer tools and technology. And I think that's the difference, but I think it's the same shit, different flies done creative ways that are just great for Atlanta. That's such a great point, Karen. I love, we heard your whole statement too. <laughs> um, I'm dropping the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else want to respond to this idea? I mean, I love the social media observation. Obviously, that's different. You know, how are the spaces that you see today different or just the same, different, you know, version of the same? Is that to the other panelists or to me? Yeah, that's to the other, other people if they want to respond to that or if they feel like you've encapsulated perfectly the <laughs> scenario. I mean, I would, I would definitely add on to what Karen said about leveraging technology. That is something that, I mean, when we first started in 2002, I mean, just the money spent on postcards and stamps and having to design a card every single time. Um, and now it's like, I remember it's like when all the galleries were like switching over, we all were saying, hey, we're going green. No, we're saving three days worth of work and $300 and, you know, and post and postcard stamps like each time. But, you know, but we um, announced it as, as that. And now it's like, if you got a postcard in the mail, everybody would be kind of like shocked, um, which is great for young spaces and, in leveraging technology. The fact is like now, especially now that you can't even go into physical venues, having this knowledge to use the internet as a platform. And also now you have artists working di solely digitally and, and organizations like iBeam 
out there constantly supporting these younger voices um, means it's like this, this format is only going to open up and then maybe they can use that technology to leverage if they ever want to shift into a physical space, which I'm not familiar enough with the young spaces, uh, DIY artist run spaces in Atlanta to comment on that since I've, you know, just kind of been disconnected from it since, you know, for the last five years and just been focusing on like my work, still paying attention to a lot of artists and, and people who I've, you know, collaborated with in the past paying attention, but I haven't had like my boots on the ground here to comment on that. So I can speak to the technology. I can also speak to the fact that there's opportunities, unfortunately, in commercial availability right now. And the last three years when I had Saltworks, when I was just like, you know, when I shift from the gallery to studio like model to completely the storefront model in the west side of Atlanta. And I'll let Joey talk about all the gentrification where, I mean, <laughs> I was in the old fourth ward and then the west side um, and how I was completely, you know, unaware of, of that at the time. And, but in the last three years, just partnering with the people like Jamestown Properties who did Pont City Market, getting these storefront retail spaces that I could never afford because they were open, they were vacant for temporary shows. Now that brings a lot more stress and a lot more is like you have to have a group of people who trust you and say, hey, I got this wonderful venue in a high traffic you know, area, but there is a chance they could cancel the show and rent it out like in the middle of the show or a week before the show. That is something is like you can do if you are have a strong community, you're communicating with everyone. Those are opportunities now that I could see like happening for, you know, a DIY like artist run space. It's like, hey, here's a warehouse. It's not rented out. It's not occupied. Why don't I just call the guy or lady and and uh, say it's like, is this is this space available? I would like to, you know, do a show in it. And you'd be surprised at the openness that you might get to the reception. And of course, you'll, you'll get a lot more no's, but as with selling art, you kind of have to get used, or selling anything, you have to get used to that, of putting yourself out there, of, of hearing a lot more no's than yeses. Can I interject? I think what I'm finding is that there are a lot of people following that concept that maybe you help to cultivate, but there are a lot of pop-up art shows going on around the city where you don't have to own a spot, but find someone that's willing to allow you to display your work. Now, what I'm curious about, and maybe Felicia or someone on the panel can respond to, why is there a willingness to do that? There is something in just important and consistent with the, the understanding that people value displaying artwork. Now, I can't say what their concept and thoughts are about buying it, but they're so willing to welcome it in their space to share it. There's something that is giving to communities and to spaces that work. And artists, I think, um, should understand and leverage that, like you're saying, to use that as possibilities to get their work shown. Now, showing your work is one thing, selling it and to be able to survive, on, that's another conversation. So also what I want to say is, with these pop-up shows, people like Dosa Kim are going in and doing prints of their work as opposed to being stuck with trying to do shows with original creations. And they're moving more and more of their pieces that way. And I think that that is something that's um, really important. The, the market is shifting towards that, that I'm seeing. And I think that that is positive. I love original works, but if you still wanna get your work out there and share it at some type of um, mass distribution. I think that this concept of doing prints of your work in affordable frames is something that artists should consider. That's a great point. Does anyone, Joey, um, James, Amory, does anyone want to talk about the then versus now juxtaposition, or should I move on to my next question? I think the um, the point of well, I think we're facing a relative economic downturn of some sort, where there will be more spaces available will definitely lead to more of the opportunities that Brian and Karen are talking about. Um, I think that, yes, things are becoming more ethereal and, and digital and the need to like have a full uh, 
space to display art is not as necessary. Um, like in the 10 years we were open, you could probably count the amount of people who came in the 29 days between openings. Like it wasn't as many as you would have versus the hundreds that would come in at opening. So I don't think that, especially considering that so few brick and mortar stores exist for a lot of things now, that you really have to have that kind of like rent commitment. You can find places that will uh, let you do the shed spaces of now wherever you want to. And there is a lot of opportunity for that. And as Karen mentioned, there's like a lot more opportunity to promote it without having to have a place that people are like, oh yeah, that's the gallery that I go to. Like you could just, like on Edgewood, people throw parties all the time and it happens in like hours. So they'll just be like, yeah, we're having like a huge party down the street and like a thousand people will come out. Like you have that connection without having to go and talk and hand out postcards so that you can make these things happen. As Karen also mentioned, I don't know if anyone's actually selling any work. Uh, I do think there's, there's more of a commitment to being seen at these things and to uh, promoting them and to showing your work online than there is to actually selling the things that can help artists continue to support themselves. Um, I'd like to add a couple of things here. Uh, you know, Shed Space is like the sort of ultimate August sweaty pop-up shop <laughs> that moves across the city. <laughs> um, but when I was back in Atlanta, that was 2009 to 2014, you know, there was a lot of people who were taking advantage of these commercial spaces. And I think we have to be careful about who's gaining value on whom, you know, because one of the things Shed Space was trying to do was instill a value about community and, and connectivity. And, um, you know, I, I've spoken to a lot, I spoke to a lot of young artists in Atlanta then who were getting you know, really hot under the collar about applying for all these exhibition opportunities. And I was like, you know, they need you. You don't necessarily need them. You need, you need to understand who is bringing the value here um, in terms of people who own property. But um, that's just a sort of a response to some things that have come up. What I thought when you asked the question, Felicia, about community then and now, and this is, I'll just be clear, my own experience and maybe not everyone's, but um, when I started working with Shed Space, I really found my family. Um, and I was supported by, you know, you, Felicia, and Suzanne Van Atten at Creative Loafing, and um, there were lots of people who, in the art community, that took interest in me, like Louise Shaw and Marianne Lambert, and, um, you know, Shed Space was supported in different years by Art Papers, and the Contemporary, and Mocha GA, and Dogwood Brewery that's not around anymore, you know, and so, you know, when I when I came back in 2009, I started going out to openings again. And when I would introduce myself to people, they would go, oh, Shed Space. And I just wanted to cry because why would anyone remember Shed Space? I mean, that's how I thought of it. Um, but it's because there is a vibe in Atlanta where if you, you can become part of this family, at least, and I'm just gonna say, you know, that's just my experience. Um, but just to, 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 to express a little bit how much the work of Shed Space still warms my heart. If you can see behind me in my office, I have, uh, you can see the 2002 and the 2003 Shed Space posters that have Charles Nelson's signatures and Gretchen Hupfel's signature and a bunch of others. This is totally warming my heart. It's making me so nostalgic. It, um, can, I, can I just throw in one quick comment? As long as it's quick, because we're going yeah, to move it's to quick. Another I, I'm there with Joey. Uh, when I started Art Spot, um, I was a, a new graduate student. I wasn't really part of the art community and I feel like Art Spot changed my life because that's where I met the curators, the gallery directors, the critics, the artists. And it did become my family. It was like my entree into the art community. And I just wanted to say that I think Atlanta's greatest gift is its people. I really do think that that's our, our gift to <laughs> Um, I don't know, you called us a second city, um, but we just have this type of community that you don't necessarily experience in other places like Los Angeles or um, New York. It's just, we're, I, I don't know if it's our size, um, you know, it's the whole being a big fish in a little pond. We're big enough, but we're also small. So um, community is really important. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And actually, I'm not going to ask my next question because I think you kind of touched on what I was going to ask. But 
for all of you, was there a particular event or a moment when you felt you achieved a significant marker of success where, you know, you kind of turned a corner and something happened that made you realize, oh, all of my effort, all of my work has been of value because of this? This is Karen. I would like to respond first to that. Oh my gosh. Um, I felt that way often on Monday nights. It would, every new show that we displayed to see the community, the family, as Jason called it, come out to support their friends, the artists, to see the work, to see what's happening, and to see who's hanging out. Um, all of those were moments where I knew what I set out to do had been achieved. But I can't say exactly what the programming was like for Shed Space or Salt Work to the other um, galleries represented, represented. Um, but I think I approached it a little differently. I was not an artist. I was not a um, art student. I was not a seasoned or curator up to that point. I was someone who had an interest in doing creative things and I could do it by um, going the route of displaying artwork, but it grew. And I think where Apache and Art Mondays was different is that we were um, um, totally integrated with the visual and the performance art. Our conceptual shows, I think, included all of that in one evening. So we were able to morph and reach so many um, different groups, if you will. And um, to see all of them converge in one space was when I knew what I set out to do worked. So I also could use the space um, as my personal canvas and I became an artist of creating moods and lighting and where I would place different things like the figure models or um, a musician or conducting the artist talks and guiding those sessions with the moderated questions created a night. And it even got to a point where I was so engrossed in it that I wanted to influence it with the music. So rather than continuing with open turntables on Monday nights and having all these different vibes, I started DJing myself and creating an environment that totally told the story of the artist that I was displaying. Um, like I said, Jamil Wright, who helped me do a lot of hip hop um, shows, tattoo shows, um, being a venue owner, I leveraged those relationships and had liquor companies come out and help support the night and sponsor the event. So it became a big art party. Um, so um, I hope I've answered your question. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> is there anyone else who can remember like a pivotal moment when you turned a corner and you felt like all of my hard work is paid off because of this? I can just say quick, when, when you wrote a good review <laughs> of a show, it's like Felicia wrote about the show and it was positive. This is amazing. <laughs> And it's true. Um, being validated by critics, um, having people come and attend, having people buy. I think people purchasing artwork is so important for the artist because they then can use those resources to create more work in the future. So it's, it's a number of things together that come together that you, you say, okay, this is working. Um, the people are coming, the people are applying, the work is selling, reviews are being written. Um, and it just is, it's like a healthy um, system that's functioning, so. Yeah, I have, um, I guess, a couple of different answers to that. So the one was, would be that, um, you know, the thing, the, the thing about Atlanta is that people don't understand that it's all connected. Like, you know, I'm just gonna say white people cannot drive to certain places because they think it's impossible. And it took an adventurous spirit for people to find the sheds in shed space. And so it was sort of a self-selecting crowd. And um, when I understood that shed space was really a word of mouth thing and that people were excited to be there because of the energy that was really gratifying just from the point of you know have i done what i've set out to do but in terms of serving the art community um a real pivotal year for me was um i guess in 2003 because gretchen i mentioned her before but she had passed away and sonia young james and um hormuz menina 
and Joseph Perrigin, all three um, either specifically asked to participate to honor Gretchen's memory or specifically made work that that was in, that intended to honor Gretchen's memory. And so that made me feel not only well stitched in, but also that um, people who wanted to express their nurture toward the art community felt like they could do that through shed space. And that was humbling. That's really nice. Brian or James, do you have any pivotal moment or um, tipping point, something that, that changed that made you realize, you know, this, this is working? All my I mean, paid off. You know, the first moment was like day one, people showed up. A lot of people showed up. And that made me think, well, okay, well, there's, there's, there's a need that needs to be felt. And obviously, I mean, you were, um, Felicia, your articles and everything on the space really greatly helped that turnout. And I think that more so back in the early 2000s, the press was, was critical to that, but also it, it helped any of the artists, any of the space owners kind of self-validate, even though, I mean, we wish we didn't even have to feel have to question our worthiness, but that, I mean, it's, it's also nice to see that, but when people show up and the fact that there were so many unknowns, I mean, I will remember that and I will always like carry out how the moment where I realized it's like what I was doing locally was relevant internationally was, you know, the first um, art fair I did uh, during the Art Basel Miami week when there was only like Art Basel and Scope. And I was there, it was just the second year that I was around and I showcased uh, an artist, Michael Scoggins, you know, for the first time um, because he recently graduated from SCAD, I think that same year. And we were just swamped i mean with with just attention and sales and and not only with michael but i brought a handful of artists who i was showing who just graduated from uga and i was able to sell work from them and of course kojo griffin i sold his work because he was already known and he was already represented in the art basel fair so but the fact that all these people came to the side fair and and found me and we completely sold everything that we had brought um, was a way of saying, okay, wait a minute, the work that I'm showing here from Georgia artists speaks to the work that people from all over the world are coming to see and they connect with. So that was a very pivotal point. And that was a completely different time with the whole art fairs than it is now. I don't think that experience could be replicated now as it was then. So I was very fortunate um, to take that risk and to go out there and to have that like feedback that said, okay, well maybe all this work that I'm doing, these artists who I feel have value are reflected in, in collectors who say, I wanna buy this work and support this artist. James, do you wanna you know, add anything sure. to that? Or I'll be really quick. Um, I was thinking of a bunch of stuff because, you know, there's like reviews and, um, and like, you know, people who buy art, we sold art to the high and stuff or your future, like a magazine. That's really cool. Um, the, first, the thing I can remember is just the first show where we sold enough to pay rent. And, um, and not that like money was ever the focus of this, and I'm sure it wasn't for anybody, but like we just had rent to pay. And like we all worked, I worked at a coffee shop. Like there just wasn't enough money to like sustain it if for six months we didn't sell any art. And we had a show with John Tindall and he sold more than we thought and it was enough to like pay half of the next month's rent. And it was like, okay, cool, this is possible. And from then on, we did questionable things to make the rent, but like we made it work from then on. It was never something that I had to reinvest in. And that was really exciting because it meant that people were interested enough that it was worth maintaining and continuing on. That's great. And I I think that's an awesome point to make because I wasn't um, constrained by those same needs to sell art to remain in my space, you know, by being multifaceted with live events and 
a club and a bar, you know, our rent was paid. So I was able to do um, shows because I wanted to do them, wanted to work with the artists and didn't have the fear of not selling the artwork. So, you know, as other panelists have said, when you sell work, it is such an accomplishment that you feel, at least for me, um, that the artists on display were able to sell their work and reinvest into their creative talents. But my big applause to all of you guys who needed to move the work um, in order to remain in your space, maybe not the shed space project. I mean, that was a different a concept, which I think is also cool, but great job guys to displaying work and selling it on behalf of the artist. Yeah, you just need this cool thrift store suit. And like, seriously, <laughs> like, once I transition from like whatever the hell I was wearing to like this suit, everybody's like, please, let me give you all the money. You and had to please. look the part. That's okay. it, yeah. I had to look like a weird used car salesman and all of a sudden people wanted art. <laughs> okay, note to future artists. <laughs> cool to end on as we uh, transition to the Q&A portion of this uh, event. Great. Thank uh, you, Felicia. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yes, um, yes Felicia, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you um, everyone so far and thank you to our audience for um, being here and writing out some questions for you all. Um, and the first one I'll ask is um, from Louise Shaw and um, she is asking about, um, you know, at the beginning of the conversation, you were all talking about some of the early years of the aughts. And she says, by the end of the decade, the political climate had evolved. The Great Recession was in full force and support mm -hmm. for the arts had waned. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, and James, you had said a little bit about this too. Um, and then Brian, we heard your telling of, you know, 9-11, um, you know, but, can others speak to this shift that happened, whether it's, you know, that early part of the decade or the later part of the decade with the economic crisis? Well, for me and Apache with the end of the decade and the economic crisis, I mean, it wasn't just the art night, but all of our nights saw a significant hit and reduction of attendees. I mean, gas prices had skyrocketed. It was a lot of things happening. Um, so to go out and use your expendable income during an economic crisis, you were not going to a club and you were not buying artwork. So yeah, I saw a reduction in attendance and it became, um, you know, first this is a temporary thing and then it started to extend. So we had to get really creative with what we did. And so on a Monday night, um, group art shows was my thing. I did um, multiple shows or multiple artists in hopes that all of them would come together to help promote a night to bring crowds out. So um, during that time, and it's interesting, and I, I'm not saying that um, it's a bad thing, but sex sells. One of our biggest shows was like hedonism. It was a huge art party, a group show. It was done tastefully, but during the end of the decade, you know, you had to kind of remix your script of how to produce events if you wanted to survive. And I think that I was able to respond positively to that. And again, with the support of the venue doing other things besides just the art. Does anybody else wanna to speak to that? Or should I move on? Um. Yeah, I, we closed around 2004, so we weren't functioning during that time. So I can't personally talk about my experience working at the gallery during that time. Um, I mean, yeah. I, was, I was open and James was open. I don't know if James wants to say anything about that shift. Um, well, that was a, I mean, that was a really big shift 2008 because like I mentioned before with the fairs, you know, two fairs in Miami as opposed to 25 fairs, uh, the sales change. And then the, when it becomes like a buyer's market, you get a lot of collectors saying, hey, give me 30% off. Right. And, you know, like just asking for discounts, which, you know, you might feel is kind of not nice, <laughs> but that's just what, that's just what happened. But also, 
I moved from, you know, our building in the old fourth ward was sold right before the uh, recession, the, the housing crash. And we moved to the west side where now I was in a storefront. I no longer had r rental studios that gave me the reoccurring income. I was like 100% dependent on sales. That was not a wonderful transition during the recession, yet I managed to survive. And it was fortunate because I had great artists, you know, like Craig Drennan, Jihad Moon, uh, Brian Detmer, who had built an audience over longevity. And I was continue, I was able to continue to sell their work, but also they brought people to the space because local people were invested in artists who were invested in the local scene. Um, and it helped that they had an audience outside of, of Georgia. I don't think if they didn't have that international audience, I would have gotten the same reception. Um, but that, I mean, that was the, that's the main reason how I was able to continue on. Now, I do need to say the other shift is part of the reason why I was like, you know, I separated was I was making zero artwork at the time, at the shift. I was no longer a artist run space. I was a spaced run artist. <laughs> so I was um, basically, it was all the creativity was through the curating. And then it was about getting the artist sales, paying, paying the rent. Like that was the focus like 24 seven after the recession. And of course that changed. Um, we had kind of a different situation. I mentioned a lot of galleries closed um, at the time between like 2007 and 2010. We saw a lot of like spaces at our contemporary level close. And I think we had very little to lose. We had really cheap rent and, um, and we didn't really have a lot going on. We were really young. And so we had like another exhibition space at the Little Five Points Aurora Coffee, which was like a huge gallery space. And we sold that work and took the money from it. Like, we started our Atlantis Arts and Music Festival, and then we got money from that. And that could pay for like three months of, of gallery rental. We just hustled for a long time until I think the recession kind of chilled out, and it made us a lot better at selling artwork, that's for sure. It also helps to have like a lo really low selling point, which we did at the time. But then as we started to show better artists, they want more money. Anne Marie needs that money. And we had to kind of figure out a lot of that stuff, but I think it made us better and it definitely made us work a lot harder. We were definitely very slack until the economy went to the shitter and it really made us work a lot harder and it led to other things like the bar. We would have never opened that if not for like doubling down on trying to make everything work. Um, oh, go ahead. Oh. I was just going, you go. You. Um, well, another question came in from Liz Flaming, and um, it's also about shifts, right? Um, and I believe during this time, ACA was purchased by SCAD. Um, and so in the panel just previous to this one, there was a lot of talk about the relationship between, let's say, Georgia State and some of the spaces. And I think, you know, UGA and SCAD has come up in, in this conversation. And so, um, yeah, just wondering about what um, y'all's relationship were to those institutions, whether that uh, shift had an impact or, or not. I can speak to this just because I worked at both places. Um, I, I'm trying to think, it was after Art Spot had closed, but Tube still had some space to show work. Um, just being a professor, I, one of my goals as a professor would be to try to introduce uh, students of mine who I thought were really talented and had a lot of potential and were making great work to give them opportunities to show. So I remember I curated, I put together a show with ACA students at Tube in their um, production filming room, psych wall. 
space. And then later at Kibbe Gallery, I was uh, helping out, helping start up Kibbe Gallery. And uh, when I was teaching at SCAD, I would also take the students there and uh, curate them into shows at Kibbe. And no matter what its institution I was teaching at, whether it was Georgia State, ACA, um, or, and pardon me, I can't remember if I said Georgia State at two, but I showed ACA students there, um, or SCAD at Kibbe, um, to me, it was an even playing field. Students are students. Students are learning, they're emerging, they're making work and their work is really fresh and they have a lot of enthusiasm and energy and, and they want to get out there, they want to get involved. Um, and it's really up to the individual student to, to really put themselves out there. And um, advice just to young artists in general, whether you're a student or a young artist, um, you, you need to go to the openings, you need to go to the shows, you need to get involved because you meet people. And then mm -hmm. um, if you have one piece exhibited at um, an alternative art space and a curator will see your work and then they will ask you to show at their space. And I know historically, Marianne Lambert loved going to see all of the shows of the emerging artists because she was like shopping for artists um, to be able to show at at Swan Coach House and, and with her project. So um, I didn't see a really big shift perhaps it, because to me, students were students and, and they were great no matter where they were studying. Um, but being able to give them all opportunities to show was really important to me. So I, I did my best to try to provide spaces for them to show, whether it was Art Spot, KB, or as you guys mentioned before, um, um, commercial spaces that were vacant, like Preston Snyder, he would have spaces vacant and say, sure, you could put a show here if you want. And um, you can have the space for one month. It's yours. Do what you want. So I think that's a really good avenue to take. Well, I'm just going to say it because I left Atlanta not too long after ACA closed. And I'm still very sore about that. <laughs> I just, I just never, you know, ever, I left Atlanta and everybody got over it and moved on and I didn't. <laughs> so there, I'm on the record. My response and my connection with the uh, academic space was Atlanta College of Art. Um, when I was seeking to find artists to display, um, Apache's on 3rd Street and I, you know, drove a few blocks up to 14th, you know, and um, went to ACA and went into their, I guess their student services or their student placement office saying, hey, I have this concept and I wanna show artwork and I'm looking for artists. Can you help me figure out how to connect with some of your students? And at that time, email was the thing. Okay, we had email lists and we would send them out to different people. They gave me four pages of students by um, medium, sculptors, painters, photographers, and I went through and started emailing saying, I have a space and I would love to show your work. If you're interested, please call Karen at da 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 da. And slowly those students started to come in because they wanted a place to show their work. So I did not make that type of connection with SCAD when they took over because I already had this institutional relationship that I built with ACA. You know, the circle just started growing because students spoke to other students. Um, the energy is in the youth and I knew that. So starting with the student body, I thought would be a great way to jumpstart what I was doing and it proved to be um, correct. Over time, professors who knew what we were doing, trying to find venues for their students to go out and be a part of the community would send their students to Apache to participate in the drawing sessions. And later on, those would be future artists that I would work with. But all of that would only be possible because of my brother, who's an amazing artist and a local curator. His name is Kevin Sipp. I don't know if any of you guys know him. Yeah, that's my older brother. He was and in Shed Space. Oh, cool. I know he was. He, he's been in everything. And um, he was my, my model for always feeling that art was something that was um, necessary in my environment. So he was the reason I knew about Atlanta College of Art. And he was the one who showed the very first pieces in Apache Cafe. It was Kevin Sipp's work. 
and um, he helped me understand how to hang and display. But because of him, I knew about Atlanta College of Art and was able to kind of infiltrate the community from the way I knew how to get involved. Um, yeah, when we started, it's right when ACA closed, and definitely a lot of my friends who were there left the city um, and didn't go through the scout route. So I do feel like there were people who were already in the scene that would have contributed more that there was like this large disconnect before we got back to SCAD being a part of what was going on. And most of that was through Emory and Alex Gavars, who were professors there at the time. Um, we ended up having more of a relationship with Kennesaw and with Georgia State especially. Um, a lot of the professors were like big fans and would come through and be like, this person's good, this person's doing a lot of interesting stuff. Like they're at your level. And it made it really easy because they had much, uh, like this huge selection of artists to be like, uh, to, that we would have never met and would never, never have introduced themselves if not for their connection to BP. Um, so it just kind of moved it. Like I feel like state, that's really, it's not why state grew, but state was really growing at the time. It, it like went from being a commuter school to being this larger institution. And their art program was a big part of that. Most of the people I knew who were involved in art went to state. And because of that, then we started getting more state artists and professors that were showing. Great. Um, and Karen, you're on mute. Oh. You're still on mute. Am I heard now? Can I be heard? Yes. It wasn't just the schools, but it was other spaces that um, inspired me to kind of reach out. And I want to give a shout out to those. Blue Milk, which was one that I went in and saw what they were doing and dropped off flyers that um, allowed me to reach a certain artist group like the Michis and the Tyndalls and um, Maxwell Sebastians and then iDrum, which was, you know, doing great things and had established a reputation was another venue that I would frequent and found different groups like the Discovery Zone, who I have no idea where they are today, but used to rent studio space over at uh, um, iDrum and they made their way over to Apache. So it was the schools and local DIY run spaces that mm -hmm. helped, I think, cultivate my scene. Yeah, thanks, Karen. And also I wanna just add shout outs to Art Farm, Ballroom Studios, and Concept Union, because I was thinking about all those, those groups mm -hmm. coming into this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that actually brings me to the next question. Um, and, you know, this is kind of the goal of the whole symposium, right, is to kind of, like, remember and share these histories, right? Because it's what we, I think, Joey, you said, um, you know, during the 2000s, there was this idea of, like, we're going to get it now. And artists before were like, we did that too, <laughs> you know? Um, and so that's like something that I think will run through these conversations. But um, Shanta Mays asks, do you feel you have played a role in preserving the history and culture of art in the city? So like, you know, and maybe this is transitioning from like the actual spaces that we're talking about here, but also like how, like what you've done afterwards too. I'm gonna respond because I know Shanta Mays. <laughs> Um, I think um, my role and how we've influenced uh, um, the scene has been multifold. But right now, a lot of the groups that used to come through on a Monday night are doing things now in their own DIY, DIY spaces. They're doing some of the things that we used to do in our space. You can't see an art show now without a performance art or a figure drawing session taking place. I think it becomes um, just the norm to make an art show interactive where you're engaging the participants. And I think we did that so much so that the people that would come out to an Art Mondays began to believe that that was the formula and the recipe. So I think our contributions have been um, doing things the way we did it that influenced another generation of artists today that I think are continuing a model that worked. 
for me personally, I my first actual institutional job was at MOCA GA, Museum of Contemporary Art of Georgia, and I got hired probably because of Shed Space. Mm -hmm. And one of the very first things that um, I worked on with Annette Cohn Skelton, the director there, was mm -hmm. the MOCA GA Oral History Project, where we were um, having people sit down and we talked to folks at the um, Neighborhood Arts Center and the Nexus folks and a lot of a lot of the big the big players and that was that was a really great opportunity for me because I was I mean not just helping preserve those histories but learning about them also myself. I love Mocha GA. I remember going over there seeing my very first push pin art show. It was so freaking cool. I was inspired and I did a push pin art show. I had exposed brick walls and couldn't push a freaking pin in any of that. So we hung foam core to try and replicate that concept. And what a wonderful way to just have people come out and participate. It was great. So if you were involved with that, um, I was, I guess, heavy on your heels at the time and didn't know it. Uh, yeah, we were, we've been in a lot of the same rooms, Karen. I know, and I, I helped um, organize the pinup show for a couple years at Mocha GA. Oh, did yeah, you? Designed Great the work. Designed the t-shirt one year, and yeah, I, that was a lot of work. <laughs> it, was, it was really well done. I loved, I mean, I loved everything about it, but I liked the Mocha GA space. What I liked about a lot of your spaces that were established, you know, they were all white and well-lit and crisp and different than mine. Mine was funky, raw, and just, you know, real. And um, I like the juxtaposition of that. We all kind of came at presenting work in different ways. And it all seemed to speak to a common, you know, need in a common group, but yet we had different voices. So I love what you guys were doing then. And I'm actually hoping that maybe sometime in the future, we all should get together and kind of create a, a new art project and do a, Look at a show together. <laughs> it would be great. Yeah. <laughs> come to Spain. <laughs> Everybody's welcome. Come to my house. <laughs> All right. I'll get your number before we hang up. Okay. Uh, I just want to say um, we inherited our space from another gallery, uh, Lavenue, and he inherited his space kind of indirectly through uh, Grant Henry, who had uh, Sister Louisa's initial place before he opened Church the Bar. Uh, and now there's, we, Passed it off to another space, which is High Low Press. That's still there. Uh, I think they finally sold that building. It's a real piece of shit, uh, but it's been a corner <laughs> of in Charles Allen forever. Uh, and so that's, I feel like, the main source of like what you did. Like people might say, like, "Oh, I remember beeping. Oh, yeah, put a car in that gallery. Like, yeah, there was a car in there." Uh, but like the main thing I took away was at the end, it was like cool. Like someone else actually wants to do something here, and cultivate their own scene and like show artwork again. Uh, and the other space I should shout out is Notch 8, uh, which shares Absolutely. Me. she's doing her own thing, but like she's also showing a lot of the BB artists and uh, a lot of them she either sought out or I pushed her way because she, she saw what was really cool about them. And I was really happy to see that they still had a place to show. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll just, um, I, don't necessarily know like what type of legacy like Saltworks has in Atlanta. I just hear it word of mouth, um, mainly from you know teachers at Georgia State with like the students asking of like what what's up with this Saltworks space or what was that all about? Like some curiosity of it. I mean, I keep the uh, like the website up so people can still see like images from the show. It's incomplete because I'm still trying to locate images of all the shows <laughs> that we did. And also, you know, starting back in 2002, technology has changed and I still have to transfer slides and tape to digital. So like I deal with that as well, but it is nice though, when I went to art fairs and, and I would meet artists who happened to come through Atlanta and everything and they say, oh yeah, I saw that show, you know, when I was at school and that really spoke to me. Or somebody says, oh yeah, I came here with my 10th grade class and stuff. I mean, to really make me feel like old uh, that, and this really like 
made me want to be an artist. And so, I mean, when I started, I was hoping like more spaces like mine would open up and continue and that would create like some momentum but those things go like ebbs and flows but the main thing that like i did consciously because atlanta is my hometown and i always wanted it to be better for like the next art curious person to come around that there was more opportunities and more visibility is i joined the board of art papers which i'm this is probably like my last month <laughs> or last last event and I dropped the mic like Karen and <laughs> go out um, that this was my way because I knew like places like before I opened Nexus was what put Atlanta on the map from my understanding like that was what oh this was a place where you could produce artist books and they created a niche that people from the outside world looked at and that's something I still need to learn about. And they're going to do the panel tomorrow. So that would be um, good to pick up. The, um, but the other thing is I've mentioned is it's like art papers. Like it was around before me and it is around after me. And this was the place that I could maintain some type of connectivity or you know legacy of supporting art papers to where they make it access and Emory's doing it with their oral histories or stories. I'm, somebody give me the proper title of their books, you know, to where they are collecting the histories of these organizations so students can discover them in the future. Very cool. So my, Shout out to Art Papers. <laughs> for Thanks, sure. guys. So my reappearance on the panel is a sign that it's time to wrap up. Unfortunately, I feel like we could talk all afternoon. Um, thank you guys so much for um, your openness and everything that you've shared on this panel. It's been really, really wonderful um, to see you all together. You know, the OOs were kind of my deck, my first decade in Atlanta. And so this, on a personal note, uh, these were some of the spaces that were most influential to me when I was an ACA student. Um, and so, uh, and another thing that came up in this panel, which came up in the first one as well, is how this is a cyclical kind of space in Atlanta. And, um, and so one, many of the places that you guys mentioned um, are going to be represented in the panel that follows this one and the two that happen tomorrow. So, um, so yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Felicia, for moderating. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, you know, it's, it's been really wonderful. Uh, thank you to our audience for joining us and for your questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of them. <laughs> um, but, uh, but documentation, including transcripts, expanded images, expanded bios of all of our panelists and moderators are going to be made available on artpapers.org. And so, um, you know, if you only caught part of this or if you want to catch the others, keep an eye on artpapers.org. It's all going to be kind of coming to land there and to live there. And um, the next panel begins at three o'clock. It is the 1990s. Um, that panel will uh, be moderated by Chad Radford and includes panelists Rachel Palmberg from iDrum, Ed Woodham from 800 East, and Kelly Teasley from Youngblood Gallery. Um, so lots of the shout outs that happened here, folks will be talking about it more length in, um, in just a little while, but those uh, you do have to register for. So if you haven't registered for the next panel and want to join us, pop over to artpapers.org in our events section. There's links to each of the panels and you can register for the Zoom there. Um, so yeah, thank you guys all for joining us. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Please make sure I get contact information for these other panelists. Um, I would love to follow up after the Zoom call at some point with you guys. We'll hook y'all all up together. Thanks, Mary. Awesome. Thanks. So uh, great to see everyone. Find me yeah. on my. See you. <laughs> <laughs>